Let's drill into these factors that have been driving up costs of housing and uh, pushing affordability to all t its all-time worst, or at least the, the worst since the 1980s. Why can't Canada build these extra homes that we need? Let's bring in Mike Moffat, Senior Director of the Smart Prosperity Institute. Mike, great to see you. You have been looking at London, where you bought a house many years ago, and uh, obviously it went up in value a lot. But you say one particular factor was the land value, which appears, and I know it's back at the envelope, to have gone up 10 times. So that's one factor inflating housing costs. The actual increase in the value or the price of land yeah, absolutely. So we crunched uh, some numbers here. I bought my first home in London, Ontario for $168,000, brand new, single detached, uh, three bedroom home. Back then, the land cost would have been about eighteen to $20,000 for a one tenth of an acre lot. Um, and the development charges would have been about $5,000 at the time. Fast forward to today, you can buy the, the adjacent uh, piece of land uh, next to where my home was. If you want a tenth of an acre now, it costs $200,000, 10 times as much. And the development charges have gone from 5,000 to 47,000, so almost 10 times as much. So that's where a lot of our affordability issues have come from. They're coming from land costs and increases in development charges. What, what are, development charges are basically taxes or levies imposed by the local government? Yeah, absolutely. So in Ontario, they're to pay for uh, the big roads and parks and mm -hmm. uh, community centers and, and that kind of thing. They're, they're how uh, cities make big capital investments. And London is not unusual that across the province, we've seen development charges go up about tenfold since uh, 2004. Right. So they're not strictly just taxes, but certainly that is a big increase, uh, a tenfold increase since um, I think it was 1994. Was that when you bought the house? So 2004. So 20 2004. years ago. Yeah, 2004. So, yeah, we've had 900 <laughs> percent inflation in both land costs and development charges in just 20 years. Now, you say around London, there's plenty of places that it looks like you could build housing, including surface parking lots. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we need to open up more land. Uh, you know, why uh, this has gone up in prices, we've uh, made development land very, very scarce. And when you make something scarce, the price goes up. So uh, one way to make this less scarce is to open up brownfield sites, uh, things like uh, parking lots. We have a lot of malls in London, Ontario that are, you know, half utilized. Hmm. We can convert some of those sites to housing. You know, we could have the, the retail on the first floor, apartments above that. So there are a lot of options here, but we got to figure out how to open up more land because we're never going to be able to drive affordability. Uh, if we're looking, you know, even a place like London, looking at $2 million an acre for, for development land. What's the roadblock there to actually redeveloping these underused sites? Well, there's a few things. So the, the first is obviously just zoning and, and regulations, you know, being able to do it uh, as of right. You know, sometimes there are, you know, other physical limitations. So if it's a brownfield site, you might need to remediate the land and that kind of thing. So there can be both sort of natural barriers, but a lot of the barriers are simply regulatory. Talk to us about this. I hope I'm pronouncing it right. The vetoocracy. What do you mean by the vetoocracy? You say a culture has grown up around saying no to things. Yeah, absolutely. But it, it seems that the the default for governments and other large organizations is basically to default to no, right? That, that you basically have to prove why you should be able to do something uh, rather than the other way where, you know, you would start from a yes position and go, okay, you know, no, you shouldn't do that for, for X, Y, and Z. And again, it's one of the reasons why land costs are so high that, that 20 years ago there, we made a lot more development land available. Uh, the zoning rules weren't as tight or so on, but now we've placed all of these restrictions and we make developers jump through all of these hoops to be able to build. Um, so that sort of vetoocracy is one of the big things causing uh, this lack of affordability. Yeah, I sometimes wonder, I, I, this is a bit off topic, but if you want to set up a patio in Toronto during the summer, you need to pay a fee. Why do you need to pay a fee? Why, why should you have to pay for the privilege of doing that? Well, I, I think that's a, that, that's a great question, and and we can ask that sort of across 
across the board where we have, you know, government saying that they want all of these things, but then charging these fees and charges. And, you, you know, I, I do think sometimes you do need to charge those to, uh, you know, pay for bylaw officers and, okay. and things like that. But some of these fees can be quite excessive. That's interesting. Do you think attitudes are going to change, though, in terms of NIMBYism, or is that deeply ingrained? People just don't want multifamily to, uh, buildings near them. I, I think that's already starting to change. You know, we've seen the city of Toronto legalize fourplexes as of right. We've seen both the federal and provincial governments start to put in these as of right changes, and we haven't had a big groundswell of, of opposition yet. So. You know, it's frustrating. We're not able to do enough, but it does feel like we're finally start to, starting to move in the right direction.